principal, um, fellows, um, members of the Mark King Yu family, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor and great pleasure uh, to be here today to present the, the first Mark King Yu lecture. Um, the, uh, I have uh, over 70 slides. I won't cover every one of them. But, uh, <laughs> but I will actually put this on my web page in a couple of days. So if you're interested, you're welcome to download from my web page. Um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do today is to try to help dispel some of the common myths about today's Chinese economy. Um, and the, uh, we know that China has made tremendous progress in its economic development since it began its economic reform and opened to the world in 1978. Uh, China is at this time the fastest growing economy in the entire world, averaging about 10% uh, per annum for the last 30 years, a very enviable record. Um, GDP uh, grew about 18 times, per capita GDP uh, also grew more than 13 times in the last 30 years. It's really uh, no question that the standard of living of the average Chinese uh, citizen has greatly improved over the last three decades. Um, but it is still a developing uh, country. Um, per capita GDP is less than $3,700. Um, total GDP is less than $5 trillion compared to the United States, about you know, almost $15 trillion GDP and you know, a per capita GDP of 46000 so it would be still take a while for China to get to the same level as the, uh, as the United States. Um, this gives you a chart to show the progress in GDP. You can see that around the middle, I, unfortunately I don't have a pointer, um, but uh, somewhere around the middle, around 78, um, you, know, you, you see the, accelerate, the, the growth rate accelerated. Uh, that little blip there is 89 to 90, and then uh, it's going way up. And, the, <clears throat> and China survived the East Asian currency crisis, you remember, 1997, 98, and then also the current global financial crisis, uh, reasonably unscathed. I think likewise survived the, the, the most recent one, affecting some of the member countries of the European Union. Now, if the current trend continues, I think Chinese real GDP will approach the level of US real GDP in less than 20 years. Uh, my estimate is uh, that sometime between 2025 and 2030, uh, Chinese GDP would be approximately this, the same level as the US real GDP. So um, now, but for per capita GDP to catch up to US levels, it would take still another 20 years. Um, so we are really looking at past the, the uh, middle of the century before Chinese GDP per capita would have a, uh, a chance of catching up with the U.S. GDP per capita. Um, and, and this really shows something really quite similar. If you look at per capita, it's uh, actually growing also rather rapidly. Um, okay. The, now, I, I think despite many problems that have risen in the Chinese economy within the past decade, for example, we have income disparity, environmental degradation, inadequate infrastructure, uh, corruption, um, et cetera. But it is fair to say that everyone has benefited from the economic reform since 1978. And you know, no one, you know, very, very few, want to turn back the clock to go back to central planning days. Um, yeah, and this is really one of the very few socialist countries that have made a smooth transition from a centrally planned to a market economy. Um, you look at uh, Russia, Russia GDP actually declined for 10 straight years from 1990 to around 2000. You know, and then they discovered oil, oil price went up. Um, and many other uh, such uh, uh, former East, Eastern European countries also uh, suffer uh, quite, a, quite a bit for quite a long time. And China actually uh, um, made the transition uh, without really uh, too much uh, not trouble. Um, okay, now what about what seven myths am I going to talk about? Well, the first one is that the, the renminbi is undervalued, um, you know, uh, especially the Americans. You know, they think the, the yuan is way undervalued. I hope to convince you that it isn't. Um, the second myth is that Chinese trade surpluses cause the global imbalances. Um, the, 
and, 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 is, uh, and the third myth is that Chinese economic growth depends critically <coughs> on exports. Uh, that's actually quite important uh, to, to see that that is really not true. Um, the fourth myth is that the economies of China and East Asia cannot be decoupled from the US and Europe. And this actually, uh, I first proposed this partial decoupling hypothesis about two years ago uh, in response to the crises in, uh, in America and in Europe. Um, uh, many people didn't believe it. Uh, they said it couldn't possibly be decoupled, but I think the events show that you know, China continued to grow robustly. Uh, India grew very well, South Korea and so forth. You know, this basically show that <coughs> there is, to a certain degree, uh, uh, there is decoupling. Of course, everyone, everything in the world is, in, is interdependent today, but, but I think that the East Asian and Chinese economies can, uh, can continue to grow, even though the, uh, the US and Europe uh, may be in serious trouble. Um, Chinese household savings rates are too high. Um, I, I want to show you that Chinese household savings rate <coughs> as this thing from national savings rates um, are really not too high. They are really quite comparable to Chinese households in Hong Kong, Chinese households in Taiwan. It's pretty high, it's around 30%, you know, compared to 5% um, in the United States, household savings rate, or thereabouts. But, um, but they are not exceptionally high when you look at Chinese households in Hong Kong, in uh, Taiwan, in Singapore, and so forth. So, so, so I think it's, it's okay. But the, um, and it's the national savings rate that may be too high. It's not the household savings rate. Uh, six, China faces labor shortages. And seven, China has the uh, comparable degree of economic influence as the United States. Uh, you, you hear people talk about the G2 and so forth. I want to show you that that's uh, simply a little bit premature. Okay. Now, first of all, let us talk about whether renminbi is undervalued, overvalued. We start by considering, uh, uh, you know, the definition uh, uh, of how we identify whether a currency is undervalued or overvalued. The definition I use is a very simple one. If a, if a country runs persistent surpluses in trade, you know, trade surpluses in trade, including both good trade in goods and trades and services, vis-a-vis -vis the entire world, then it is considered the currency is undervalued. Um, you know, if it always sells much more <laughs> to the world than the world is able to sell to it. Um, but otherwise, if it's balanced, then there's really no uh, prima facie evidence that it is undervalued. Um, and, uh, and I emphasize this must be trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis the entire world. I mean, you can have, m many times you can have bilateral surpluses, even though it might be persistent it really doesn't uh, indicate anything about whether a currency is undervalued or overvalued. Um, uh, um, unfortunately, the, the US politicians always focus on the bilateral uh, surplus uh, deficit as opposed to the overall. Um, I want to show you some statistics on the Chinese trade, trade balances over the past three decades. Um, and you will see the following. Um, this chart, the blue, line is the uh, Chinese exports, the red line Chinese imports. And what you really can see is that if you go way back and you look, uh, have run it all the way through, then it, it's actually close to zero. The trade surplus is really close to zero. Uh, you know, the, the green line at the bottom is really close to zero until around 2005. It really did not begin to rise until 2005. This is vis vis-a-vis the whole world. Um, and 2005, which is here, um, it, it began to rise, and then it reaches a, a peak around 2008. Uh, and these are monthly data. And then it's began to come down, and the last month it's actually turned negative, and it's coming back a little bit around, around again around zero. Okay, so this this actually shows very clearly that the um, <coughs> that that the vis -vis the entire world, China really does not did not begin to have a surplus until around 2005. Right. Um, the, um, so so if, if anything, if there were any undervaluation, it really has to be after 2005, right? And not, and not before. But the, uh, um, and okay. And this actually shows another ch uh, interesting chart. The, the green, the, the, the blue line 
indicates the Chinese, uh, the U.S. deficit with the world. You know, total U.S. trade deficit with the world. And the bottom line, the red line, is what you saw earlier, namely that this is the Chinese trade surplus vis-a-vis -vis the entire world. You can see that the U.S. has been running huge deficits, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the world, um, you know, since 1998 at least, but, you know, um, and, and China really did not have a surplus on their way down to 2004-2005, like I said. Okay, so, um, so the, the Chinese surplus is really not <coughs> in any way, uh, you know, did not in any way cause the large trade deficit in the U.S. It's already pre-existing uh, condition uh, by the time you get to 2005. Um, now, in 2005, the, the yuan was allowed to appreciate and rose around 20% in nominal terms and 25% in real terms uh, by the end of 2008. Um, and, and that apparently had this effect uh, of uh, causing the Chinese trade surplus actually to come down. Okay? And, and now it's actually uh, close to, to balance. Um, the long-term goal of the Chinese government is really to reduce the Chinese trade surplus to zero. Uh, and if the current trend continues, um, the goal of zero annual trade balance can probably be achieved by 2011. Okay, not by this year, but by 2011, without necessarily any large adjustment in the nominal yuan to US dollar exchange rate. Uh, you know, so, so, th so this is uh, <clears throat> the answer to the question whether the yuan is, is undervalued. Okay. Um, the, <clears throat> the second uh, the question we consider is whether the Chinese trade surpluses cause the global imbalances. Uh, many people talk about this, you know, that there are large global imbalances in funds flow and this was due to the Chinese surplus. Um, but if you look at the previous chart, you know, we know that the Chinese trade, the U.S. trade deficit, um, you know, existed long before China began to run the surplus. Okay, so, so, so the Chinese surplus could not the U.S. deficit could not be attributed to Chinese surplus. Um, and in, in 2000, for example, U.S. trade sur deficit was uh, $380 billion. Chinese trade surplus that year was less than $30 billion. Okay, so, so the two really are not uh, quite uh, connected. Um, but what is really interesting is to look at the, let me see, uh, look at this chart. And this chart shows the Case-Shiller U.S. Home Price Index. Okay, this is, you, could, you could use this index as an indicator of the size of the uh, asset price bubble in the U.S. And you could see that the, the red line is the Case-Shiller Home Price Index. And it was 100, the index was set at 100 in 2000. You can see it went up steadily until it peaked around 2006. Okay, and then um, the home prices began to drop and that led to the subprime crises and they dropped further and uh, as the crisis deepened. But, um, and the blue line that you saw up there is actually U.S. trade deficit vis-a-vis -vis the world, okay? And that tracked pretty well, okay? I mean, it's, it's very much the U.S. trade deficit, uh, which is financed by inflow of uh, capital and the, uh, and, the, uh, and, and the expansion of the U.S. Uh, money supply um, that actually uh, is, is feeding this uh, 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 this uh, asset bubble, but the Chinese trade surplus is down below. It really didn't have anything to, much to do uh, until when uh, the, it peaked at uh, 2008, and that is precisely when, after, way after the bubble uh, in real estate uh, has burst. You know. so, so again, um, what uh, it is clear here is that the, um, again, the Chinese trade surpluses could not possibly have caused the, uh, the large, so-called large global imbalances. I think what is really happening uh, is, is actually the fact that the oil prices uh, went up during this period and the, and the U.S. imported uh, uh, you know, uh, increasing uh, quantities of oil at increasing prices. And I think that is really the major source of the U.S. trade deficit vis-a-vis -vis the world as opposed to um, the Chinese uh, uh, trade surplus. Now, the, the third thing I'd like to talk about is whether the Chinese economic growth is critically dependent on exports. There's really a common misimpression that the Chinese economy 
is highly dependent on exports, and in particular on export surplus as a source of growth. Now, what I already show you uh, should be enough to convince you that the trade surplus is not critical to Chinese growth. You know, China has been growing at 30% per annum for the past 30 years, and the surplus, if anything, you know, only, only started to occur in 2005, and is now also uh, in 2010, uh, is actually come down to, to almost zero. So they couldn't possibly uh, be reliant on the export surplus. Um, but, but then, um, what about exports itself? Um, Chinese exports as a ratio of GDP actually rose steadily and reached a peak of almost 40% in 2006, and then began to decline to around 25% uh, in 2009. Um, this is a large ratio, 35%, 40% of GDP. Um, by comparison, uh, Japan, uh, the export to GDP, GDP ratio is only around 15%, you know, less than 15%. So there's a large ratio. Um, but what, but this is not as large as Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan, where exports are usually more than 100%, sometimes a couple hundred percent of GDP. Okay, these are smaller economies, very export-oriented. Um, but the export GDP ratio for China actually exaggerates the importance of exports in the Chinese economy because it fails to take into account the low domestic value added content of Chinese exports. Okay, let me, let me sort of explain. Now this is what I talk about. You see the exports of goods and services as a ratio of GDP uh, was actually very low before opening. Um, you know, in 1970, it was less than about two and a half percent. And it rose steadily, and then until it reached a peak around 40% in 2006, and then it began to, to come down. Um, but you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the number is large. Okay, I mean, you know, you have to admit that the number is large. What, what I'm trying to say, though, because is that the domestic value at the content of Chinese export is very low. For every dollar of uh, for Chinese exports, only about thirty cents at most uh, actually consists of domestic value added. So the other seventy cents uh, would consist of imported raw material, imported parts, imported components, and so forth. Um, on some products, uh, such as the iPhone, you know, uh, I don't know, if <laughs> most people have seen an iPhone. iPhone probably retails around five, six hundred dollars in the U.S. Its landed price in U.S. is probably about three hundred dollars. Uh, it is actually finally assembled in China. Okay, uh, but the Chinese contractor, which actually uh, makes the iPhone, uh, makes about five dollars per iPhone. Okay, because all the components are imported, you know, the chips and everything. So, uh, and that's, exa that's a very, very low value added, but, but on average, the value added of Chinese export is very low. Uh, so, so that's the first thing to remember. So even though the export ratio is high, the content, the value added content of, of the uh, exports is low. Now, if we take, say, 40% is export to GDP ratio, and we multiply it to the domestic value of the content, 30%. Okay, you know, so what, what do you get for, is the GDP generated, uh, value added generator of exports is around 12%. Okay, so 12% is the GDP that's attributable to Chinese exports. Now 12% is, a, is still a large number. You don't want to lose 12% overnight, <laughs> you know, um, the huge depression. But if 12% of the economy does not grow, uh, it's not so bad, as long as the other 88% continues to grow. So, so that's the, the, way, the way to think about it, is that that's really what's happening in China is that the, uh, over the last year, um, last year, arguably, 2008, 2009, Chinese exports declined by around 25%. Okay, you know, it's a huge decline. And, and it really, uh, it actually drove many smaller firms out of business, okay, in, in areas around Hong Kong, in Dongguan, Shenzhen, um, you know, areas around um, <coughs> uh, Shanghai, uh, you know, so, um, but uh, now what does that mean? Um, now, if you, uh, if you accept the fact that 12% uh, of GDP is generated from exports, okay, and exports decline by 25%, so to a first approximation, the uh, effect on GDP is around 3%. Okay, so 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 that's so I'm not saying there's no effect, okay, but the effect is is that GDP would be down by three percent, and and that's more or less what happened. 
But then the uh, Chinese government, you know, launched this two-year, four trillion yuan uh, economic stimulus package. Um, I don't know why I have economic twice, but okay. <laughs> the um, um, and and that basically make up the shot for. So so last year, for example, China was able to grow at around 8.7 percent, and uh, and I think this year, um, I think it will continue to grow. I hope not too fast, uh, but uh, but I think we'll be able to do at least eight percent. Um, and you know uh, because of the the stimulus program uh, is for two years, so this would be the second year of the stimulus program. Um, but all that I want to say here is that the Chinese growth is really not critically dependent on exports. Okay, I think that, that you know, we really have to look at it uh, in that, uh, that kind of uh, uh, perspective um, because uh, it will, some parts of China would be affected and, and sometimes very severely, but for the country as a whole, it's not that critically dependent on, um, on exports. Um, the following charts are actually quite interesting. You can see here what I have plotted is quality rates of growth of exports of goods um, going back to, say, 1997. Um, okay. Um, you can see the red line is China, and, and there are various other economies um, uh, in East Asia, you know, Indonesia, Malaysia, and so forth. And the important thing to realize is that it, it, they all seem to go up and down together. So exports of China is really not immune uh, from fluctuations on the outside, right? And um, and and then you look at imports uh, follows more or less the same pattern. Um, you know, China also goes up and down, just like uh, all the other economies. Um, but what is really interesting is that if you look at the quality rates of growth of real GDP, um, and the red line you can see is actually. There's you know, some ups and downs, but it's really stay above, you know, uh, reasonably robust. Whereas all the other economies, you can see that they go up and down. Okay, so so this again shows that the China, because of its size, is you know its size, you know, exports really cannot be that influential on on the country. So it is a little bit like the U.S. The United States is not really dependent on exports. Um, and uh, so, uh, you know, so you know, exports up and down, it's slightly better, slightly worse, but it really wouldn't have a uh, decisive effect on, say, the U.S. economy. And similarly, exports would not have a decisive effect on what's happening uh, in China. Um, and, um, and I think Chinese ac economic growth in the future, in that case, will mostly depend on internal demand rather than on exports. Now, then we talk a little bit about the decoupling hypotheses. Um, the, um, the decoupling hypothesis is actually a very simple one. It simply says that, okay, um, could East Asia and China be, be uh, continue to grow uh, even though the US and Europe are in recession? Okay, I mean, you know, I, I would say probably 30 years ago that would not be possible. Okay, but uh, over the last 30 years, what has really happened is that <clears throat> there's a great deal more trade and investment within East Asia itself. Okay, and, and therefore, this region has, in part, becomes much more self-contained. You know, it's not completely self-contained, so, so there would be some impact, but, uh, but the impact uh, is not, again, uh, is not uh, totally decisive. Um, so let me show you a couple of charts. This is East Asia share of world GDP from 1960 to now. Okay, the 1960 is around 10 percent, a little bit above 10 percent. Today is around a uh, quarter uh, of what world GDP is generated in, in East Asia. A quarter of GDP is roughly speaking, uh, uh, you know, the equivalent to the U.S. economy. Um, U.S. is about a quarter of the world, and then the eurozone is again another quarter of the world. So, so this is about, roughly speaking, the same order of magnitude as the uh, United States. Um, this is China's share of GDP, which remains very low because despite all the rapid growth. Um, it is actually around 7% at this moment. Okay, now, so, so you can see that compared to the US, it's still relatively 
uh, are small. I mean, you know, uh, seven percent of GDP. Um, what, what is uh, what is interesting, however, is that the um, is that East Asian trade uh, has really changed uh, directions. It used to be that when East Asia trades with uh, <coughs> trades East Asian uh, countries, when they export, they export to the United States, they export to Europe. They don't export to one another. Okay, but over the, um, the last 10, 15 years, it has really changed. Um, now this tells you that the, this really shows that the rising ratio of East Asian trade and total world trade, it, it, it went off from about 10% to around 25%, again a quarter, so paralleling the growth of GDP. Um, and Chinese trade and total world trade is actually similar from 1% to 10%. Um, but what is actually uh, um, quite uh, more interesting is what I want to show you now, is this is the share of East Asian exports destined for East Asia, okay? You know, not destined for uh, America, not destined for Europe. You can see here that it is in the 90s, it began to be around 50%, so maybe half the trade. Anyway, the fluctuations uh, every month, every quarter, but uh, on the whole, it's around half of the trade is uh, within East Asia. And the imports, uh, share of East Asian imports originating from, originating from East Asia is again uh, around 50%. Okay, pretty steady. So, so this is basically what uh, uh, gives credence to this idea that there's partial decoupling. That is, okay, half of the, you know, you can think of, you know, you know, half, you know, half your customers may be in trouble, but you still have the other half of your customers. You're not losing all your customers. So that's the, the way to think about it. And therefore, um, the, um, uh, you know, the China East Asia uh, would have a chance of continue growing, even though um, the US and Europe uh, 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 may are in recession. Um, okay. Now, uh, next, I want to address the issue whether Chinese households are saving too much. Uh, and this has sometimes come up. People talk about Chinese households saving too much, that as if only they will consume more, um, you know, that uh, China would export less <laughs> and therefore would have a smaller trade surplus, etc. Okay, But, but, you, but you, already, you can already see that the export surplus is actually really coming down quite rapidly. There wasn't that much before 2005, and then now... Uh, it's actually come down very rapidly. Um, but I want to say that the, I want to make a distinction between national savings rate and, um, and the uh, household savings rate. You know, they, they are really very different. National savings rate is what a country as a whole uh, saves. Okay? And, and households save, but corporations can also save. All right? Because you know, they make profits and they reinvest the profits that would actually be Consider as part of national savings. Governments can also save as government run surpluses, all right, which is not so <laughs> not so usual, <laughs> but uh, but uh, possible. All right. Now um, the uh, um, okay the the high sa national savings rate. Let me say, among other things, uh, that the Chinese economy can finance all of its domestic investment needs from its own domestic savings alone. Okay, and does not have to depend on foreign capital inflows. You know, either portfolio or foreign direct or foreign loans. So that is another reason why um, you can you can think about it, why China can continue growing even though uh, you know the, uh, Europe and America uh, you know are in recession because you know they have they don't rely on uh, either the United States or Europe to provide uh, the funds for investment. Okay, they have enough domestic uh, resources to do it. Um, this is a Savings rate, the national savings rate, you can see it's very high. It's actually at the end, it's at post 50%, okay? you know, um, which is very high. Um, but, um, and I would agree that when you say that China has excessive domestic savings, but at the same time, it also has excessive domestic investment. Okay, see, because what is available for uh, export, okay, is really the difference between savings and investment. Okay, you can have excess savings, but if you also have excess investment, then there's not that much left over for you to, for you to export. 
Right. You know, so, so the export surplus is really the difference between domestic savings and domestic investment. Um, I, I admit and China has too much savings nationally, but it also has too much investment. All right? so, so to the balance, the difference, of, you know, of course, would be equal to the um, trade surplus, but we know that trade surplus uh, really is not very large except for this period between 2005 and 2008. Um, now, um, okay, so, so I think that is one, one idea. Um, now, if you look at the savings, um, okay, uh, now let us turn to look at the household savings rate. Household savings rate actually has been much lower. Um, as I said, it's, it's about 30%, and that is really comparable to the household, to household savings rate in Hong Kong and in Taiwan and, and in Singapore. Um, well, Singapore is a little bit more problematic because um, there's the small savings through the central provident fund. Okay, so you know, depending on how you how you look at it, but this is the the savings rate of urban and rural households in China that we actually obtained from survey data. You can see that you know they are not they're not exceptionally high. All right, and 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 what I'm trying to say though is that the high national savings rate is really a result of the corporations, you know, making large profits and reinvesting. Okay, so unless the corporation will start distributing those profits as dividends, you know, to the shareholders, to the household, the government, so they can spend it, uh, the national savings will remain high. And, and it really has very little to do with how the households adjust, because the households are actually not saving that much. All right, you know, they are, so, so I think that's the, um, so the idea is really that um, the, not to get the household to spend more money, but to get more income to the households, <laughs> right? You know, because they are spending enough money already if they have more income. All right, so, so that's, uh, that's why I emphasize the households are not really saving too much, um, but, uh, but the uh, uh, corporations, they're not distributing the, the profits and they're reinvesting it. And, 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 and I think something has to be done to force them to distribute profits. Now, this, this chart is interesting just to show you that retail sales have been growing very fast. These are real retail sales. That means retail sales um, adjusted for the change in prices. Um, you can see here, they are all, almost all, in the last few years, almost all above 10%. Um, and in, in the, uh, um, this year, first, first quarter, last, year, last few quarters of last year, you can see they, these are real sales, real retail sales. And that really shows that there's really no shortage of consumption. It's not that the household's not spending, <laughs> right? It's that you need to get more income to the households. But getting more income to the households uh, has uh, really two barriers, two, two difficulties. One is that China still has lots of surplus labor, right? So, so, that, you know, so there's really no upward pressure uh, on sort of unskilled entry-level uh, wage rates. You know, there's, uh, I'll show you in the next few charts. There's almost unlimited supply of labor who are waiting to be transferred from the primary sector, from agriculture and mining to uh, the industrial sector, the service sector. Right? So, so there's really no upward pressure on wage rates whatsoever. And you can't really, I mean, so, so that means uh, you cannot really, uh, um, you know, uh, easily increase the income of the households. Um, now, the other uh, obstacle is that the uh, Chinese enterprises, uh, especially state owned enterprises, they don't like to distribute dividend, cash dividends, okay, <laughs> because um, they want to keep the money so they can invest whatever projects uh, they, they want to invest. Um, if you use your retained earnings, you don't have to ask for permission from anybody, right? <laughs> so, uh, so I think unless the Chinese government takes a stronger stand and force, and force these enterprises to declare more cash dividends. Um, it, it's also very hard to, to increase the, um, the share of labor. The share of labor in, uh, in China is actually uh, quite low. Um, the, in most Western developed economies, the share of income received by, uh, by labor, by workers, is usually around uh, somewhere between 60 and 70 percent. In China, it's less than 50 percent. Right. But, but as I explained to you, it has something to do with uh, the labor market, which will come down to here, whether the Chinese economy face labor shortages. Um, 
The um, uh, answer is no. Um, the uh, China actually operates, still operates very much uh, uh, on the regime of surplus labor. Uh, the economists among you will be familiar with uh, the surplus labor theory, which was uh, advocated by the late Professor W. Arthur Lewis, Nobel laureate, and uh, about 50 uh, years ago. Um, the, uh, the way to think about it is the following. Um, if you look at the distribution of Chinese GDP by sector since 1952, um, uh, the red part is uh, 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 tertiary sector, and the green part is the um, uh, primary sector, agriculture and mining, mostly agriculture. And the blue part is the secondary sector in this industry, mostly construction and so forth. Now, you can see the uh, agricultural sector used to generate 50% of GDP is actually falling down to just a little bit more than 10%. Okay, you know, so, so, so remember, 10% of GDP, generally. And the industrial sector is now around 50%, service sector is around 40%, roughly speaking. Um, now, if you look at the distribution of employment, you see a very different picture. Um, you can see that the uh, uh, employment of the primary sector used to be above um, 80 percent. Right. And over the years, it's shifted around uh, the late 70s is around 70 percent, you, know, um, you know, beginning of the reform, about 70 percent. It's now down to around 40 percent. But you have 40 percent of labor force producing only 10 percent of the GDP, okay? So this, this means that the productivity is very low in, in this sector, right? And, and as soon as there are opportunities, people, labor force from, here, from the primary sector will want to move to the industrial sector, move to the uh, tertiary sector where uh, productivity is much higher and uh, the pay is much better, okay? And, and that depends on whether there's enough capital and so forth to move them over. But the important thing to realize is that as long as this condition persists, there's no shortage of labor, okay? I mean, there's no, no real pressure on uh, wage rates, entry level, I mean, unskilled entry level wage rates to go up. Um, you know, skilled wage rates, another matter altogether. Um, so, uh, so, that, so that's, roughly speaking, the story. Um, and, and it took 30 years for the percentage of labor force from, say, uh, 1980 to 2010, 30 years. The proportion of labor force went from 70% to 40%. Right, about one percent a year. I think it would take another thirty years, okay, for in order for the uh, proportion of labor force in primary sector to go from forty percent down to ten percent, right? You have to get it down to below ten percent, right, before you get significant upward pressure because the percentage of GDP generated by primary sector would also go down over this period. It's right now around ten percent. In thirty years' time, maybe five percent, right? In in the U.S., proportion. A percentage accounted by the agricultural sector around two percent, right? So, so I think. But but what I'm trying to explain here is that there's no labor shortage, and it will be a long, long time, uh, you know, at least a couple of decades before there will be serious labor shortage affecting uh, the Chinese economy. Um, okay. Now, finally, I want to talk a little bit about whether G two is a reality or not. I, I, I certainly think it's, very, it's uh, simply a very premature idea. We already talked about the, the U.S. GDP is at least three times larger than the Chinese GDP, approximately. Uh, per capita is even a uh, uh, greater disparity. But, but what is really interesting is to look at another uh, measure, is the rate of technical progress. How, how uh, <coughs> Uh, how, how does China compare to the United States in terms of the ability to produce, uh, to increase its productivity, okay, roughly speaking? Um, now, one of the important ideas, uh, important uh, instrument for improving productivity is R&D. Okay, it's doing research, investment in research and development. And now, let us uh, look at this. Now, in China, the uh, R&D expenditure as well, uh, absolutely, which is the red column, has been increasing very quite rapidly. And also R&D expenditure as a percentage of GDP has also been rising very rapidly. But it is now around one and a half percent. 
Okay. Now, but by comparison, um, this is R&D expenditures ratio of GDP for many different countries, for the G7 and China, and as well as uh, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and Singapore. Um, what you can see is the following. Japan is the, is the golden line up there, around 3%. Um, the U.S. is the blue line, is around 2.5% right, of GDP. But 2.5% um, but on the much bigger GDP, right? And China is down below at 1.5% one, one of GDP, right? So, so the, you know, the GDP is smaller, but the ratio is also lower, all right? So, so you can see that it would take a long time, again, for the R&D expenditures uh, of, uh, of China to really catch up in absolute terms uh, to the U.S. Uh, uh, to, to the U.S. R&D expenditure, plus the fact that the U.S. has been investing in R&D, very substantial R&D, for a long time. Right? You know, so it has built up a great deal of R&D capital, uh, and China would take a long time to catch up. Now, uh, one of the things uh, indicator here is, is very revealing. Um, I plotted the patents granted in the U.S again for all these countries, you can see that the U.S. is right on top. Its uh, patents granted annually is about 100,000, close to 100,000 per year, right? Um, down below is Japan. Japan is actually, this is logarithmic scale, so Japan is probably uh, just a little bit about 10,000, maybe 20,000 or so per year, right? Um, and, uh, and so forth. Down below the red line, China had one patent in 1985. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, it's just you know it, it just hasn't applied, right? So, so the first patent in 1985, but you can see it's going up. It's been going up, but still it's very low. It's around on the order of 1,000 patents per year, right? Compared to 100,000 patents per year, All right? Now you could, you want you might want to adjust it because it's too far away, it costs money and so forth. But but still the gap is quite uh, quite clear. Um, and the light blue line is quite interesting. Light blue line is South Korea. Um, and then the light green line is Taiwan. You can see that both of them actually are now producing about a little bit less than 10,000 patents per year, maybe six, 7,000 per year, all right. Um, and so forth. The, the, the Italy is not doing too well. I think China has overtaken Italy in terms of patents. But anyway, um, but what I want to show here is that this is another measure of economic strength or economic power. It's really to look at the ability to innovate or the ability to increase productivity. Um, and, and this thing, uh, this chart is quite interesting. It's the following. If you look, if you plot the patents on this axis, and here you plot R&D capital, you know, R&D capital is basically what a country has invested in R&D cumulatively. Uh, over the years, and you depreciate by about 10% per year, um, you can see almost a, a perfect fit, right? That is, the more you invest R&D, the more patents you generate. But it's not what you invest this year, it's what you have invested cumulatively that would actually generate the... Uh, so, so, uh, so by this measure, it would take China a long time. You know, I, I won't say it would never catch up, it, it will catch up at some point, but it would take a considerable time to catch up in this, uh, uh, in this area. So, um, so the, my conclusion is that the talk about G2 is simply, uh, you know, still too early. It's real premature. Um, I know time is up, so maybe I will, uh, I think I've answered all of the <laughs> talk about this, and I would uh, stop here and, Prince, can I, I take a few questions? It would be, okay. be lovely. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you.